Okay, so it's day 282. We're going to go over the news headlines today, try to make sense and clarify what's going on in Ukraine at this time. So we're going to start with the ISW, and this was their account yesterday. Um, and I'm going to skip the first part and go right to the battlefield one. Uh, they're still trying, the Russians are still trying to take Bakhmut, which is somewhat ridiculous. The Russian forces are continued to uh, make marginal advances in Bakhmut area amidst ongoing offensive operations. Now, I want to uh, reaffirm that they're, even if they take it, operationally, it doesn't do much for them. But this is what's being published. A Russian mill blogger published footage claiming to show Russian forces conducting offensive operations in this area. Uh, another Russian source claimed that Russian forces could now interdict all roads in the Bakhmut direction. CNN published a video on December 1st, which Ukrainian military commanders in the Bakhmut area tell a correspondent that their forces are outnumbered and facing serious supply issues. And then Ukrainian military commanders also told the CNN correspondent that Russian forces are committing significant forces to the assaults in Bakhmut and are suffering heavy casualties. So when I talked about it a couple days ago about why Bakhmut, uh, like it's, it, there's this long field and it's hard to cross. And it, I mean, it's a killing zone is what it is. I mean, it, so if I, and I said on that video, I said, like, if I was the Russian, or not the Russian, the Ukrainian command, I'd be like, yeah, Putin can't take this, even if he, even if he, it was all a whole army of Putins, or, you know, if he was riding shirtless on a dragon or whatever, right? Like, I would want them to keep pushing all their resources into Bakhmut, because you got to get across this long, like, there's nothing to hide behind for a long way. So it's, it's a terrible place if you're a Russian soldier to try to assault. Okay, the ISW previously assessed that the Russian effort to take Bakhmut is a high-cost effort concentrated on a city of limited operational significance. And that's that's what it amounts to. Okay, where's Bakhmut? Here it is. And they're taking these areas around here trying to get up to Bakhmut, which again, it had real significance back in the Lusichans uh, server to nest days, where if you could take this, you could then encircle because the, the Russians, remember, controlled this. And so if you could control this highway, you could encircle. But right now, it doesn't make that much of a difference. It's just like their pride on the line. Okay. Um, the U.S. is trying to negotiate for transfers of NASM's air defense systems from the Middle East to Kiev, according to the CEO of Raytheon. There are NASM's deployed around the Middle East, so some of our NATO allies, and we are actually working with a couple of Middle Eastern countries that currently have them to try to move them to Ukraine. So that's what's going on there. The Pentagon also reported that Raytheon has received a contract for the production of NASM's surface-to-air missile systems for Ukraine of $1.2 billion. So... Uh, if they can get them there, that'll do some significant damage. Okay, uh, I'm only going to read the headlines here and let you just, if you want to look it up, uh, you can look it up, but I'm not going to get into the details because it's profoundly disheartening. Russians uh, de deliberately beat Ukrainian hemophiliac, threatened to rape his 17-year-old sister in front of her father. How about that? These are, uh, Ukrainians are our brothers. They're, they're not their own state, but they're part of us. But, and this is how you treat them? Mm, something's not right about that. Okay, children trained to be Putin's faithful soldiers in Russian-occupied Crimea. I'm not reading this one either. I talked about this at some length in a previous video. You can go back. It's the same stuff again. Um, let's see. Russia's vic uh, vicious tactics in Ukraine serve only to further expose its weaknesses. So when we're talking about stuff like this, like... Really, you're beating a hemophiliac, rape, uh, you're threatening to rape his 17-year-old uh, sister in front of her father. So what's going on? Why Why are you doing that? Why are you bombing uh, civilians and civilian infrastructure? Okay, so Sergei Lavrov was asked a tough question about Russia's shelling of Herzan, a city it claimed to annex in September and then fled in November. The question was this, how can you justify missile attacks on the civilian population infrastructure, depriving people of access to water and electricity, including the area of Herzan, which Russia considers its territory? That's what he was asked. And he said, his reply was, the city of Stalingrad was our territory, replied Lavrov, referring to modern uh, modern city of Volgorod that was staged to the deadliest battle of the Second World War. We hit Germans in such a way that they ran from there. Yeah, but you're hitting the civilian population. That's the difference. The civilians. And you're indiscriminately, as long as they're Ukrainian, you don't care if they're civilians or military or whatever. You're trying to hurt civilians. Who are you trying to hurt? You're trying to hurt people like this lady and her child. That's who's going to freeze. So 
it's not really an acceptable answer to say that that's what you're trying to do. Sorry, Lavrov. Um, the opposite appears to be true. While they're trying to look tough, they're actually looking very weak by doing this rather than sending their missiles at the enemy soldiers. While Russia attacks power infrastructure have been designed to show strength, coming shortly after it was forced to retreat from key towns and cities in the Ukraine southeast, they nevertheless expose Russia's clear weakness going into winter. Putin has told German Chancellor Olaf Scholz that the attacks were a forced and inevitable response to Kiev's provocative attacks against Russian civilian infrastructure, including the Crimean Bridge and energy facilities. <laughs> then on RT, this is the editor of RT, Margarita Sim Simeon. Uh, they are planning to take our Crimea. And she goes on and says, and we're doing the only thing that we can do in this situation. We're bombing them. We're bombing them every day. We're bombing their infrastructure. God knows it isn't what we wanted. I know this isn't what our leaders wanted either. <laughs> Look, you're not on the side of virtue, lady. Um, the FSB, so what, hap what happened is, they invaded in a foolhardy effort. They thought they would take this, the, the country in a matter of weeks. And when they got sucked into this vortex, they can't let go because, they, you know, uh, we don't want to look like we're beat, but they can't hold on. And so this is where they are. In fact, the FSB security service never bothered to engage in contingency planning nor envisage any outcome other than its own success. Hmm. So that's why they're bombing, because they can't figure out how to do anything else because they can't beat the military on the ground and that's what's actually happening. So she and her baby are going to suffer because of some planner's incompetence in Russia. Okay, uh, this was interesting. I, I don't know what to make of it. Up to 13,000 Ukrainian soldiers killed since Russian invasion, says Kiev. Okay, um, 13,000 sounds remarkably low, but there's potentially some reasons for it, and let's try to unpack it. 13,000 Ukrainian soldiers have been killed since Russia invaded February, uh, according to Kyiv's presidential advisor, Mikhail Polodek. Ukraine has been tight-lipped about the number of military dead and wounded, citing its worries that it were revealing would give Russia a military advantage. In August, uh, Zeluni uh, said 9,000 people have died. Okay, let's just say that 13,000 is the number. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at 13,000 times 3, that's the casualty multiple, plus 13,000 thousand and that brings us to 52,000 which is roughly half of what the US estimates are. Now they have ground truth whether they're telling the whole truth about it that's a different story and maybe they're for the sake of you know not freaking people out saying it or maybe they're telling the truth I just I don't know but here's what I do know that's awfully low compared to what they're saying the Russians are but there is something else going on at the same time. Now, that, that number, 281 days times about 50, day, uh, 50 casualties a day, which let's say that that seems reasonable. It was upwards of 100 or 200 um, killed a day. I mean, upwards of 100 or 200 per day in uh, the height of the worst fighting, right? So, but there are also pauses. So let's say 50. That would be about 14,000. And that's not too far from the 13,000, but that's assuming only 50 a day or less than 50 a day. Um, so there's that. But now there's one other factor that's, that uh, is, should be involved here, and that is the three to one rule. So the three, three to one rule of combat states that in order for the attacker to win a battle, his forces should be at least three times the force of the defender. But it doesn't extend to casualties necessarily that easily. It does, it's not a one to one kind of thing. So here's an academic article about assessing the con uh, conventional balance. And it says the three to one rule applies to just one aspect of the campaign, namely breakthrough in battles in which the attacker attempts to pierce the defender's forward defenses. Okay, so we get that. That doesn't mean that there's three casualties uh, for the attacker to every one defender. That's that's not what it means. But if but there is probably because of a defensive position an advantage casualty wise um, between attacker and defender. But if Ukraine is claiming eighty some odd thousand killed, eighty five thousand or so killed, and they're claiming only thirteen thousand killed on Ukraine side, that something's doesn't seem to to match. And I, I don't know what it is, but I don't know how to... So if you know something more about this, I'm more than happy to hear and feed into my understanding. Build some dendrites in my head. Let me let me understand. Put, put something into the scaffolding that helps me understand it more. I'm just reporting what they say in the news and 
it just seems imbalanced from what I can detect. There might be some reason for it. I think one of the reasons for it is that you, when Ukraine is counting killed, they're also counting anybody who has fought against uh, Ukraine, not just Russia. And this could be, you know, these... Uh, militants, uh, militia pressed into service that have no training that, you know, just go very quickly. Uh, that could be part of it. I don't know. You tell me. Okay, let's keep moving on. Ukraine, the, the surrender hotline. I absolutely love how clever Ukraine has been in uh, just being so innovative throughout the war. So now they have a surrender hotline for Russian soldiers. I, the I Want to Live project was started in September. Uh, key, officials in Kiev said they've had more than 3,500 contacts from invading personnel as well as their family, right? You you get there and you realize, uh, as a Russian soldier, the, oh, this isn't what I thought it was told it was. How do I... You know, I don't want to die. Um, how do I sur survive this? Maybe I should surrender because I, I don't really, I'm not really wanting to fight here anyway. Uh, so they get up to 100 inquiries a day. And so, yeah, that's a very smart way of, and if you can get them to somehow give themselves up somehow, that's far better to take them off the battlefield that way um, than by the other way. Okay, Russia is using the Caspian Sea to launch strikes against Ukraine, so they're using Russian territory, Belarusian territory, the Black Sea, but they're also using the Caspian. And so remember, they have a navy here. So let me zone out a little bit. So Ukraine is up here. Here's the Black Sea, and here's how you get the the Caspian is essentially landlocked. I mean, for all intents and purposes, I mean, you can get out through a river or something maybe, but that that's it's pretty well landlocked. And they have ships in there because there and they, there's other countries here like uh, Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan and Iran. And so they're also, but all these other countries are aren't in Georgia. They're not saying anything about like, you shouldn't be doing that from our neighborhood. Uh, and there's a reason they're not doing it. And that's because they are, you're being intimidated by what's going on in Ukraine. And that's my estimation. I could be wrong. They also know that they can't stand up to uh, Russia in that sense as well. Okay, the ISW, um, I just have one last thing before we turn to uh, fun with Russian state media, which is always a good time. Here's the ISW's, uh, the long-term risk of, this is today, the long-term risk of premature ceasefire in Ukraine. The wise seeming counsel of a seeming, uh, seeking compromise with Russia at a point of high leverage for Ukraine is dangerous folly now, okay? So don't do that, that's what they're saying. It merely puts off and makes even more dangerous the risks we fear today. The path forward should be clear. The West must prioritize reducing Russia's ability to renew a war that the Kremlin is more likely to win and that would carry the same escalation risk as the current war. So you already have the escalation risk. It's here. Next time it's going to be here or maybe even further as Russia goes home, licks its wounds, regroups, builds more weapons and comes back if you have a peace that is not a unconditional surrender kind of peace in Ukraine, where they can actually get their kids back who have been stolen and uh, deported into Russia, and they can provide reparations for the things that they've damaged. And you, you just need to, this will be one on the battlefield, not at the peace table. Okay, let's have some fun with Russian state media. So here we go with the first article. Another massive attack on Ukraine, Kyiv, Lviv, Kharkiv, Odessa, cut from electricity. And again, they're, it's like they're, they're celebrating the idea that uh, we're destroying Ukrainian infrastructure. Oh no, we really don't want it, but what choice do we have, says the editor of RT. No, you do have a choice. You didn't have to do this to begin with. Um, so just because you're going to have a black eye and you're going to look bad before, on the world stage doesn't mean you don't have a choice. You still have a choice. Okay, Kremlin, Joe Biden's terms on uh, terms on talks with Putin are impossible. Well, what does he mean? Uh, so uh, French President Macron was at the White House yesterday. The fact of the matter, says Biden, is I have no immediate plans to contact Mr. Putin, said Biden alongside uh, French President Macron. So the Kremlin's response to Biden's remarks, the United States will not recognize the new territory as part of Russia, which complicates the search for grounds for mutual discussion. So... So neither does Ukraine, and that also is part of that complicating factor, and we need to be honest about, like, you can't just say, they're bad because they won't compromise. You won't compromise. <laughs> so uh, you can't just, I mean, it's a pot calling the kettle black. 
All right, and one more. Uh, Russian forces do not need a winter break. They will grind down Ukraine in early 2023, as well as they did in 2022, I hope. Uh, the Bakhmut agglomeration has been liberated almost completely, and the Russian troops can now move on. It's, 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 it's laughable, but this is psychologically all that they have to look forward to is that area around Bakhmut. That's, that's like the only place that they have not been pushed back where they're still kind of making, inching their way in progress. And... Yeah, that's that's what they're reading in, in Russian state media. So, I mean, if you're and I, I read this daily. Right. So Pravda, RT, TASS, but Pravda and RT tend to be the nuttier ones by far. It's it's all Russian state media, but these just seem to be a little bit more extreme. OK, last thing. And this is just an image I want to leave with you. This is Russia, uh, not Russian, Ukrainian special forces operators uh, training and it's not so much for the training. It's for look at the conditions that they're in. All the troops are in this condition. They're outside. They're sleeping in the ground in tents or something along those lines, not getting warm. This is rough. And good on you. I mean, I hope you can make some progress over this time. Um, my heart is with you. I am so sorry that you're going through this, but it's on day 282. Nobody thought we'd be to do 282 on day two. And good on you that you're able to hold off this terrorist regime because Russia really is a terrorist regime as long as you have. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for being the kind of person that cares about Ukraine.